was thinking about it the other day, and I, I came to the conclusion that the 1950s, 1960s uh, American animation gave us some of the most accidentally risque names that we've ever had in comics and cartooning. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. So, and I started thinking about it, and the list was not short of accidentally risque names, all from like 50s and 60s. You ready? Wow. Okay, go ahead. Chili Willy. Accidentally risque. <laughs> no one needed that. A very, uh, yeah. Woody Woodpecker. Come on now. We could have done better there. From the, from the same studio, no less. If, if you didn't have a Chili Willy, you had a Woody Woodpecker. <laughs> Quick Draw McGraw. Why did it have to be that? Oh, oh, uh, you know what? I never thought of that for poor Quick Draw. No wonder he was always hitting people with that big uh, guitar of his. Snagglepuss. That one, come on. <laughs> that's right, that's right there. They they oh, saw it, they saw it as oh, they were writing the name out. That's a little bit much, yeah. <laughs> oh, heavens to Murgatroyd. Heavens to Murgatroyd. Oh, by the way, what is a Murgatroyd? It's great copy is what it is. That's just good writing. Heavens to Murgatroyd. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, it is. It's great, but I've never sat and wondered what a Murgatroyd was. But what do you think it is? Because it was maybe it was just that kind of specific studio that like came up with a name after name after name where you're like really inventive, but also just a little bit dancing yeah. on the edge. <laughs> like Chili <laughs> Willie, they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing in the 50s and 60s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they had, there was no question that, that, that they were up to something. Uh, you know, I think a lot of it is just, I, I think it was that, er, that time in early TV where it, it's similar to the early time on the web where they were testing limits. They were yeah. like, let's see how far we can push this. Let's see just how far we can get before we get pushback from from the either the studios, the networks, or the parents. Well, I, I found out just this week, actually, because my wife was telling me about, you know, she works in TV, and there's this group called yeah. Standards and Practices, which is sort of the network yeah. has, an, uh, uh, you know, an executive that their whole job is to be like, you can't say Chili Willy. You could say Chili Willard, but you can't say Chili Willy, that kind of thing. Uh, and yeah. so apparently <laughs> Standards and Practices first got started not as a, a corporate job, but as an advertiser representative. So like Marlboro oh, cigarettes really? would have a person called standards and practices and be like, uh, listen, uh, we love, we at Marlboro love everything you're doing, but you can't say Chili Willie. You gotta say Chili Willard. Yeah. And then eventually the <laughs> network just figured out, oh, it'll be faster if we just had that in house, you know? Right, right. But isn't that fascinating that that was a job from the advertisers to be like, no, 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 we don't want Marlboro associated with Willie. Uh, we, want, we want Willard, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And and they and they and they took control of it obviously so they could standardize the process too so they just had one set of standards across the whole thing yeah because that was the thing is that every advertiser would have different rules so you eventually yeah. you're like well let's just standardize this this is ridiculous wow but uh, I found that fascinating anyway so Chilly Willy America's cutting edge comic character and on that note I'm going to say hello everybody <laughs> and welcome to Comic Lab the show about <laughs> making comics. And making a living from comics, I'm Brad Geiger, the author of the Web Comics Handbook and the creator of Evil Inc. And I'm his friend Dave Kellogg, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave, let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. I guess I left one out. I was thinking about it and Thumper could probably be included into the accidentally risque. Oh, Thumper. Yeah. Thumper. Yeah, that Thumper is absolutely somebody who's up to something. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like that's that famous apocryphal story about the uh, Disney animators that showed the film to Walt and then he fired them in the room. Do you ever see that? Did you hear that no, story? No, I don't know about that It's a one. vaguely apocryphal story. I don't. I won't go into the whole thing, but it's a, uh, it's uh, anyway, they, they, those Disney animators were up to some stuff on the side. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, I will say that this show is going out live to our Comic Lab live gab group over at patreon.com slash comic lab. So you can watch yeah. the show recording live every week. And there is a concurrent chat down the side with all of our friends and pals. And we answer questions before the show, during the show, after the show uh, with extra uh, more in-depth stuff as we go into it. So join us over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And Brad, you had a fun topic to start off the show today. 
Well, it, it, before I, I got something even double fun before I start out with topics, because I've got to tell you, this week we're being sponsored again by our friends at DreamHost. If yeah. you go to DreamHost.com slash Comic Lab, you'll see a whole bunch of starting offers for getting uh, in control of your own work. You've heard us say on the show over and over, own and control your own work. Yes. Well, even though you may think that that means putting it up on an app or a platform or something else, what that actually means is having a website that you yourself control. Not not a platform where somebody made it push button, not an app that somebody says, oh yeah, well, we'll make it easy for you. Uh, no, here's the secret. It's very easy. It's not very complicated. It's gonna take a little bit of doing, but uh, everything worth doing right is worth getting actively involved. The good news is you've got a whole bunch of people over at DreamHost that are ready to help you take that first step and get started on actually owning and controlling your own work. Absolutely. And remember, this is coming from the horse's mouth because Brad has been using and loving DreamHost for years now, almost approaching a decade, coming up on it. Yes. Uh, and so you're going to want to head over to DreamHost.com slash Comic Lab and you'll see two uh, a specifically designed um, starter uh, levels for Comic Lab folks. There's the yeah. $2.59 a month. $2.59 yeah. a month. Yeah. Oh my God. You can't you can't <laughs> throw a stick in, in this world to get something great for $2.59. <laughs> That's the uh, truth. And then there's a shared unlimited plan for $3.95, also incredibly affordable. So do head yeah. over to dreamhost.com slash comic lab and jump in with Brad's personal and hearty endorsement of the service. Absolutely. And now that we've gotten that bit of fun out of the way, let's talk about this uh, because it's really been on my mind over the last couple of weeks. And remember how we started talking about uh, there was that email service. I forget even what Substack, I think it was called. That was uh, that we said, listen, wait 366 days and then you'll actually know what's up. Well, yeah, I'm going to start another 366 day counter. And this one, I, I am not, I, 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 I'm champing at the bit to have this next year over because I am officially tired, sick and tired of hearing about AI software doing comics, uh, AI software doing art, AI software doing writing. We even had a story where they they put AI software in charge of a business and everybody gets all giddy. Everybody gets all giddy. Oh my goodness, look at what this done. And it was AI software and look at this, look at this. And I'm telling you, I'm going to start another 366 day counter because once the novelty of that shit wears off, we're going to really begin. I'm not saying that AI is going away because that's not right. the truth. That's right. not going away. But that's when we're really going to be able to judge it. Because right now, if you say, hey, this AI software made this comic, you get a lot of attention because it's novelty. I saw right. somebody uh, I, somebody on Reddit just uh, the other week say, hey, I put in a prompt and got this as a joke. So I made it into a comic and it had thousands and thousands of upvotes. Spoiler alert, it wasn't a very good comic. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. good. It wasn't funny. There was nothing there. But the novelty had everybody upvoting, right? And same thing with that uh, business. I, 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 this AI is doing business decisions and, and people have invested money. <laughs> Listen, 366 days. I'm counting it right now. Today is March 28th. March 29th next year, when the novelty of this shit wears off, I'm not. And again, I'm not saying it's going away, but then we'll actually be able to judge it because I'm sick of hearing about it now. Everybody's going to be good and sick about hearing it by next year. And when the novelty runs off and you can't get everybody to, to get all excited and giddy yeah. about AI software made this comic, they're going to be like, yeah, we've heard that now uh, 345 times already. I'm not interested then, and, and by the way, if, and, and these people who are doing this stuff that are doing push button comics, they know it themselves because they don't dare put that comic out and not tell you that it's AI involved. If it was good, they just say, here's a comic, but it's not right. good. They got to right, say, right. here's a, a comic that AI did. And isn't it? So once, once we get past this year, another, another 12 months, we'll finally be able to judge AI in creative spheres competently because this novelty is going to get old really, really fast. And then we'll actually know what we're dealing with. So I think I'm on the same page with you, but I want to clarify, you're not saying in any way, shape or form 
that discussions about concerns about uh, articles about AI are going away. AI is a, a, a now a permanent presence in our society. Oh, and it's yeah. going to get more and more talking m- about it for a long time. Yes. You're saying specifically this sort of Reddit, Twitter, Insta thing where you're seeing a comic going, hey, look at me, zip, zap, zoop. I plug this into GPT-3, yes. GPT-4, and look yes. what I got. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, I, and, I agree and with also, you. also, as long as we're clarifying, I'm also not saying that the uh, scruples of AI are going away or are no. going to be solved somehow. I'm not going to say the copyright infringement is going to go away. I'm not going to say all of the IP theft that is happening with all this stuff that people try to sleep, sneak in, like, you know, some of these big platforms and stuff, try to sneak in AI so it can go through and, and catalog all of your stuff without you opting in. I'm not saying that's going away. What I am saying is after 12 more months of, Hey, look at this. I pushed a button and now I'm a, I'm a creative person. Right, right, right. right. Once we have 12 more months of that, then we can actually say, see the potency of uh, AI in a creative sphere because, again, uh, it's, it's not going to mean anything to say, hey, I pushed a button and now I got a comic. Hey, I, I put a prompt in and, and, I, and, and now I got a joke and now I'm going to I'm going to do a comic strip based on that uh, based on that setup. Then we can actually see the role that AI is going to play in creativity, because right now my main point is the whole reason we're talking about it so much is the novelty part. Yes. And when the novelty yeah. wears off, then we can start to have an actual talk about how this is used in creativity. I I don't disagree with you. I think you are right that the the sort of novelty social media shares will yeah. go away. Yeah. But I think what it will be replaced by is actually the absence of discussion about AI that's actively being used in artist process. I think that's yeah. what you're going to see. No yeah. one's going to talk about it. But I think, like, for example, I was thinking about this the other day. If you have a property like The Simpsons that's worth globally about a billion dollars, you know, as a yes. brand, and it's on season, I think, 30 now, and um, you have literally tapped every storyline you think you can tap, right? You've brought in new writers every couple of years, but some of them, although I know a couple of the writers on that show, they've been there since season one, but yeah. uh, you bring in new writers, you're trying to get fresh blood in every once in a while. And uh, here's what they could do with a brand that's worth that much money. You could plug in every script of the Simpsons and say, what haven't we explored yet? What right. what venues of of Homer's life, of Bart's life or Lisa's life? Because that brand is worth so much. It's worth yeah. having AI iterate just idea pitches because it's 30 years of stuff to 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 iterate on. Right. <laughs> yeah. And just have different iterations like we're going. But we're not going to hear about it. Fox will never admit right. to that, but they'll quietly give the producers. I'm just saying there there are ways. And, and Simpsons was just a, a foreign example. It's uh, you know, it, it's not that they're going to do it, but right. you could see brands. You could see artists. You're going to see uh, all sorts of painters and writers and sculptors using AI, I think, as a part of their process, not the end game of their process, but a part of the process specifically to generate a volume of ideas that they're going to then editorialize and reduce down to the things that truly mean something to them as an artist. And then they will actualize it, you know? No, I think you're absolutely right. And and I, and again, I don't think it's going away. Technology never really goes away. And this is, this is literally one of the biggest ones we've had in the last 50 years or so, probably since a personal computer, you know? Yeah. Well, it was really, I was talking to my storytelling class uh, at at UArts yesterday, and I was talking to them about how literature, the, the, the idea of reading and writing is technology. Okay. Because we didn't, we didn't come out as babies trying reaching for a pen to share our thoughts. We were oral in nature and reading and writing is a technology. And I was having this conversation with them about every generation shames the younger generation about their technology, right? Right. Uh, The boomers, the boomers who grew up being told that they were listening to the devil's rock and roll grew up to put uh, explicit language warnings on rock albums. Right. They they grew up and told the younger generation they were bad for the Internet. And then we who came up in the Internet uh, shamed people over social media. And I looked at my crowd of social media generations and I said, you're already feeling a little bit uncomfortable and rightly so. 
but you're feeling re- very uncomfortable about the technologies that are coming up that you didn't grow up with. But here's the secret. That generation's going to grow up with that technology and they're going to be very comfortable and they're going to find something else to be upset about. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't doesn't mean that it's okay. doesn't mean that it's right. doesn't mean that it's wrong. Again, AI has all kinds of scruples problem uh, that are involved with all kinds of uh, moral uh, and ethical issues that are involved with it. Yep. But that next generation ain't going to look at it the way we do. No, Uh, no. And it's just, it's not right. It's not wrong. It just is. Yeah. It's going to be the equivalent of those, those first houses that had a telephone in the house or put electricity in the house. And they're going to be like, really, you've brought this into your home, into your life, you know? And so the first, the first people that start to uh, incorporate AI into their workflow, people are going to be like, really, you, you use AI for your Microsoft Excel spreadsheets or for your word uh, editing, you know, Microsoft word editing. Cause that whole thing, (laughs) Microsoft's uh, presentation of how they're incorporating AI into uh office 365 that actually seemed like holy hell that seems really useful i was thinking about how to use ai uh to give it access to my shopify sales for the last year and say give me all the best routes that people what products pushed what products uh how they found it what's the best route give me give me literally the best the top 20 routes that people went to buying a sheldon book or a drive book and i could do that myself now but it's instantaneous giving it to an ai you know right you'll probably get slightly you'll see patterns that you might not otherwise see in the data that the ai sees and so anyway long story short we're gonna there's gonna be a whole generation that grows up with that incorporated into their life in the same way that we all grew up with phones and personal computers and previous generations would have been horrified by that you know yeah um so yes it's going to become background noise to our life yeah and yet and yet even though i in the previous discussion we had about ai i think i was the more optimistic one yeah. like oh yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be worked into artist workflows and and it's gonna be i think it's gonna be really fun and yeah. and i do think that's true <laughs> but I'm increasingly horrified by the speed with which uh, uh, GPT is getting better. Yeah. And like, even though the the problem that we all humanized when we're like, ha, look at the way AI can't draw hands. Ha, ha, yeah. AI, yeah. all humans are still better. Within literally, what is it, three months now? Yeah. It's doing hands beautifully. Perfect mm-hmm. hands. Absolutely perfect hands. You know, you can have no problem at all with the hands. So that was a three month window. You show yep. me a, a 14 year old artist that can go from not being able to draw hands to being perfect at hands in three yeah. months. Doesn't happen. So yeah. we're, we're absolutely effed. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm no longer so optimistic about the future with AI. You've gone from half full to, Oh my God, it's all ashes and whoa. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is absolutely how we destroy ourselves. So that's yeah. my new attitude, but I'm, I, I'm rolling with it until I, uh, I, cause I don't, the thing is you can't stop it. It's not like you or I are going to stop yeah. the billions of dollars that are flowing into this no no and and we're not and, and we're not going to shame them into doing it uh ethically we're not going to shame them I the, I the only hope we've got in terms of some of those ethical problems are some of those outstanding lawsuits that from some of the big players like getty images and so forth might uh might turn some of this around but uh, never stop it. No, it, it it might slow it might it might redirect but it's 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 here we've got to start We've got to start taking some real long, hard looks at how we're going to deal with it. Yeah. And you also have to hope that the net um, moral compass of humanity, like, for example, if you've trained an AI on all of humanity's output. Yeah. Do you think, Brad, that that is a net good or a net bad from a species that's <laughs> homicidal and genocidal? You know, oh. like, or do we have a net a positive? Uh, you kind of hope we do because AI yeah. is about to learn from all of that. Yeah. Uh, or do we have a net negative? And I, I so it's I having trained AIs on the output of humanity over the last two to three thousand years. You hope that there is a net positive there yeah. and not a genocidal uh, positive or you know leaning genocidally. Uh, anyway, huh. Ah, Fred, now I've got myself (laughs) sad. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, before we get any sadder, let's change topics here really quick, because you had something written down here having to do with hunger. And I'm very interested in what's on your mind this week in terms of that. So I, I, I think what happens and this, this sometimes um, hits us all, but I've had more of an existential mood the last couple of months about my career. Um, existential in terms of thinking about bigger questions, not thinking about like the day to day stuff so much. I've got the day to day down. It's the yeah. it's the bigger like what's next? How do I handle this? What do I do next? Um, and so and I think that's because there's a lot of change going on in my own personal life right now. But the thought that I had and I wanted to ask you, 
because I I don't know that I have the full answer is it could be summarized. Are we still hungry? Yeah. You and I as cartoonists or the people that we came up with. But let's we can we can localize it to just you and I, because my concern is has, has a modicum of success. And keep in mind, Brad and I are driving around in solid gold cars, but we're no. making a go of it as as that reader at yeah. Emerald City Comic Con <laughs> said to me once. Um, <laughs> we're making a go of it. So has that modicum of success made us lose some of our fire? Uh. And is that OK? Is that the natural cycle? But my fear is from an existential level is I don't want to become hmm. the 50 and 60 year old cartoonist that we encountered when we were yeah. coming up that refused to change or refused to see the writing on the wall in terms of how the industry and careers were going. So, uh, and also they just weren't working as hard and we could see it as 20 yeah. something, 30 somethings when we were coming up and, and, Granted, you know, there's a season for everything and there, the season of being 20 and 30 is to work harder. We yeah. just don't, you and yeah. I, for example, just don't have the same levels of testosterone to work till two in the morning that we had when we were 25. Mm -hmm. But um, do we, are we still hungry? Do we still have that fire, Brad? Uh, it's interesting you mentioned the older generation. We, when we were coming up, those syndicated cartoonists who looked at their business changing and reacted mostly with fear. Uh, the big difference between us and that generation is yeah. that we were directly involved in our business, right? We were, we were, we were in charge of our business. We were, we were right. business people and creative people at the same time, by and large, that first vanguard of web cartoonists that came through in the early two thousands through 2010, uh, we were, we were, and, and we were involved in our own business. And that's, I think that's going to be a little bit of a saving grace. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Uh, because this past month or actually the, the, the past two months, I've had a steady decline in Patreon, right? Not, not enough that I'm not going to be able to pay my bills, but uh, enough that it's got my attention. And part of it was I came to the end of a chapter I, and I, and I always give myself at least a week, if not two weeks to focus on the writing Right. And I was having a real hard time this this time around. And I it stretched into three weeks where I really just needed to focus. I couldn't start that new chapter yet until I had planned out the next uh, uh, 20 some pages. And I it just wasn't ready yet. It just right. wasn't ready. I right. if I started, I was going to cause problems for myself. So and what I found and I've said this on the show a lot of times, uh, most of my Patreon backers come to especially the new ones. They come to me through my website, right? It's yes. why yeah. it's another yeah. reason I preach about the website all the time. When I, when, when I get a new Patreon backer, I send them a one question questionnaire that says, how did you find out about my work on Patreon? And 77% of the time it's your website right now. Certainly social media might show them where my website is. We we're not going to go through all that again, but here's what mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Over three weeks of not having a significant update of my website, I saw a very big impact on my Patreon. And that's, of course, the, the main leg under my table. It's a big, big part of my month to month is that Patreon. And when I lose a couple hundred dollars at a time on that, it, 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 it wakes me up. OK, right. and I can I'm here to tell you, Dave. That when you're faced with that, when you look at a monthly income that's uh, a couple hundred dollars off uh, what it should be for the second month in a row, and you look at that cumulative impact, you get that fire back real quick. Because <laughs> I know sooner that happened. Now sooner that happened. And Suddenly I have you have this campfire under your ass. You're like, oh yes, God, back on. Yes. Here we go. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, I've I've got I have got a plan of attack. I've I've written out the entire month of March, the entire month of April, what I'm gonna do, how I'm gonna do it. I'm scheduling Twitter posts, I'm scheduling Reddit posts. I, well, Reddit, I'm not scheduling, but I'm scheduling social media. I've got notes now all over the place. You're doing this. You're doing that. I told you a couple of weeks ago, I got a note right over there on that whiteboard says, when you don't promote, you lose money. 
reminding yeah. me, you got to keep talking about this over and over and over again. Right, I right. got a little bit soft on that. And not anymore. Not this month. Go yeah, back yeah. over my Twitter. You'll see guaranteed something every day of the week at different times. So I, I'm tracking what times get better exposure, get better views. I'm way, way more. Whereas all of this stuff that I'm talking about was kind of autopilot for mm-hmm. an awful long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of a sudden you see those numbers go down and you get that fu- <laughs> it's disguised. It's, it's, it, I don't know whether fire in the belly is the right, uh, uh, idiom or whether it's just an ulcer. They feel very similar, <laughs> <laughs> but you get that fire in your belly back real quick. And, and part of it I'm going to argue is because we were always in charge of our own business. So when we see that we've got a long 20 some year uh, uh, history of when we see that number go down, what brought us to Patreon in the first place? The ad numbers were going down and we said, I have to do something about that. Not, yes. my, I hope my, th- not, I hope my syndicate does something soon. I hope these people over here stop doing what they're doing. I hope, I hope this, I hope that. This. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. said, I got to make something happen. And that's right, why right. I'm going to say that if in your existential crisis, if you get to the point where you see your numbers going down, that fire will be back before you know it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's traceable where this, conver- this conversation with myself is coming from. It's, I can see the writing on the wall with Twitter uh, is yeah. absolutely going to be falling oh, apart within yeah. the next 12 months um, and yeah. probably sold off for parts. I, I mean, uh, I don't know who would buy it out, of, but, you know, it went from $44 billion valuation of actual money spent. Uh, granted, it's Saudi money, but actual money spent uh, now it's worth $20 billion. That's massive, you know, and you can, yeah. it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So oh, yeah. Twitter is, is being removed from my table. Silicon Valley bank failure and how all of Patreon's cash was wrapped up in there. That was a jolt to my system that, oh God, yeah. that's a reminder that Patreon at some point, they're going to have to pay the piper with their venture capital or their angel yep. investors, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, where they're going to have to have a return that's worth it for those early investors, right? And so at some point, Patreon's going to have its own inshittification. And so, but there's also the realization that I'm not 25 in your, anymore. And I, I, you know, daily life can't be as intense as I lived it when I was 25. You just can't do that forever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so a part of it is like, oh, I... I and I not rested on my ro- laurels, but I enjoyed the fruits of a decade or more of labor for yeah. a while. And now yeah. I'm seeing the writing on the wall that maybe I need to wake myself back up again because things are changing mm-hmm. again. And I don't I don't yet know how they're fully changing and I don't know what full direction they're going on, but that I feel like I have to f- to to take the embers of my campfire and start going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and and get back some of that fire in my 20s and 30s a little bit, because I feel like the next two or three years are like a liminal period where there's going to be a lot of change. And I don't know where we're headed towards, but we're definitely walking into it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and, and and listen, I this this we we talked not too long ago about the fight. We're technically as far as my count, we're in the fifth age of web comics. Right. We, we've gone through big sea changes several times and we're yeah. due for another one. Right. And, 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 and there's, there's going to be another big change that happens just around the corner, not too long from now. Uh, and, and like I said, on the show uh, a few months ago, the good news, I mean, the bad news there is it's going to hurt. It always hurt. It always comes with a little bit of pain, but the good news is every time it's happened, we found ourselves in a little bit better place. Every time yeah. it's happened, we learned a little bit more. We, uh, we, we were able, able to pivot. We were able to evolve and adapt, uh, you know, and, and that's, that, I guess that's my message to you is right now you're feeling a little bit of a crisis. Uh, but here's the deal. You've been there before you've, yeah. you've, you were there when the ad uh, market tanked. You, you had the experience of paying a lot of bills with ad revenue and getting those checks in and going, Holy moly, this is great. This is going to last forever. This is wonderful. And then ad blockers came up and it drained, drained everything right out. And you made, you, you did what you had to do and evolved and adapted and, you went to a crowdfunding system. We've done this so many times and we've done it. We have that experience. Uh, I, my, my message to you is 
it's going to happen again and yeah. you're going to survive. Yeah. I mean, so can I put words in your mouth and you tell me if this is what you, uh, yeah. I'm going to try to translate what you're saying that it's actually a good sign that I'm worried about. Can I still be hungry? Because I'm yes. having learned from past moments of change. I'm seeing it happening again and I'm saying, okay, time to start revving the engines again. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not caught flat footed. And okay. Yeah. So that actually is helpful actionable thinking in that this is my brain telling me, Hey, listen, it's time to start waking back up again. You, this is not a time for resting on laurels. This is a time for starting to experiment and explore again, because I'll be honest, my push back into Reddit is, is akin to what we did in our twenties and thirties, which for me, just for me, I know there's people that have been living and swimming on Reddit for the better part of a decade. But, uh, I, for me, Diving back into Reddit a, a little bit feels like, hey, I'm trying to figure this out again. It's a new yeah. system, a new uh, land that I'm trying to explore. And so um, I guess that's the echo that's triggering for me is that it feels like the first years of us using Twitter or the first years of us using Kickstarter or Patreon is me trying to go back out there and find new avenues to get new readers. Um, yeah. Now that Twitter's falling apart. In, in a way, it's like your spidey sense. It's, it's like, yes, this is, yes, yeah, this is you and you've earned this through building your career for a certain number of years. Right. And now it's like you, you, it's that old familiar feeling, you know, something's up. It's like a rabbit that all of a sudden uh, puts his ears up in the field. They know something going on. And, 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 and that's why you're doing Reddit. That's, and, and that's why a lot of us we immediately we're very interested in looking at uh, different alternatives like Hive and and even Tumblr, going back to Tumblr and Ello. And the only thing that we really know for sure, the only thing that I can you can take to the bank is it ain't going to be Mastodon. <laughs> By the way, who's <laughs> mentioned anything about Mastodon in the last two months? Nobody. It's already yeah. all but disappeared. I, th I know everybody was upset with me when I said, hey, it ain't going to be Mastodon. Guess what? It ain't going to be Mastodon. It really isn't. I, 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 there are very few things <laughs> that I'm very conf confident about. This is one of them. It ain't going to be Mastodon. But that's but that's your spidey sense is is, is you are right now. You, you're getting that old familiar feeling and you're starting to uh, get the, some stuff uh, started because, listen, things are going to things are going to start changing very, very quickly. And, uh, they, you know. And when it does, you're going to you're going to adapt. You're going to get through it. You're going to do just fine. Yeah. No, I think that's encouraging words. It's, it's also this fear feels different just because I'm a few years older now. Yeah. And I'm wondering <laughs> if I can muster the same um, call to arms that I did when I was younger. But you're right that as soon as soon as that income is in any way challenged, like you felt yep. from Patreon a, a month yep. or two ago, as soon as that hits, <sighs> I, I bet you I'm sort of going to be like, look at me run, Brad. It's chariots of yeah. fire down the beach. Da, 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 da. Like, look at me go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had I had two high school students. Uh, we did a, a Zoom chat. They're 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 working on it. <laughs> They're working on it. Actually, one of my old students from UArts became a teacher and a couple of his kids are working on this comics project where they're going to talk about comics publishing and everything. And they're mm -hmm. they're building a, an app or something. And it's, it's it's neat. Right. And so they had me on Zoom for an hour and they were asking all my all these questions. And the one kid asked a good question. He says, talk to us, us talk to us about motivation. How do we stay motivated? I, what, how can we be motivated? Cause sometimes we start a project and we don't want to finish. And I said, well, listen, that's kind of, at, 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 this is pretty natural for your stage right now in, in creativity is that you know, there's a lot of st things that are, uh, uh, you know, competing for your attention. But I said, I'm going to tell you the truth about motivation. Uh, and that is this, I can't tell you how to be motivated. There's lots of people who are wanting, who are out there telling you that they can tell you how to be motivated They're and they're, and they're all trying to sell you something, either a calendar or a, a software. They're going to tell you how to be motivated. I said, here's the secret about motivation that I'll share with you. If you ain't motivated, you should probably go do something else because you're going to get your ass paddled by people who are more motivated than you, who want it more than you. And they're going to, they're going to, they're going to outrun you every time. Yeah. So if you can't be motivated, go do something else. And it's not my job to motivate you. Now, I'll tell you what, there's two things that I've used that you can definitely uh, see if you try it on and it fits. Fear, mm -hmm. 
Fear is an excellent motivator. If I think that I ain't going to pay my mortgage next week, you better <laughs> believe I'm motivated. And I said, number two, spite. Spite. I, part of the reason I'm doing this 23 years later is that they told me I couldn't do it 23 years ago. And I'm still working off that spite. So I said, I found my motivators, fear and spite. Fear and spite works great for me. But I said, you got to find what motivates you. And anybody who tells you they can get you motivated is selling you something. You got to handle that for yourself. Well, you know, one of the bigger motivations I had in my 20s and 30s was, and I think I shared this with you, um, was that I always knew uh, that I would never be the best cartoonist, that no one would ever say, Dave Kellett, he's the best cartoonist. Right. Well, no, holy no. shit, I knew that I could outwork most people, you know, yes, not everybody. Yes. I, well, I certainly can't outwork you. My God, there's, if there's one person <laughs> I've met in this world that can outwork me, it's Brad Geiger. I, I can't outwork everybody, but by God, I will outwork 95 percent of other cartoonists. Uh, to And and just by showing up again and again and again and getting yes. the work done. It's amazing how over years and how over decades that can build a career. So yeah. uh, there's been a lot of cartoonists that that I compared unfavorably to in terms of talent over the years mm-hmm. where they were mm-hmm. clearly far better than I was. But they, like a, like a version of a trust fund baby or a nepotism baby, they just didn't put in the work. Yeah. And, and they're not here around anymore. And they're not they're here not around anymore. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, it, I, I agree with you that that you got to find your own motivation. And for Brad, it was spite. For me, it was just the knowledge that I would never be the best. But my God, I, I might be able to outwork the best, you know, I'll just work yeah. more um, and 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 have a stick to itiveness to it. And so I guess that's what that's a little bit what this concern about losing the fire is, is I always prided myself on that fire. And and um, I guess it's just a concern. It's a little bit like um, Jack Welch, who was the CEO of GE, um, who is not a great person, not a good human being. But mm. he had that quote of like, um, I think it was him that always, always stay paranoid, you know, in business. And I found a version of that to be helpful in the background of my mind of my cartooning is always being paranoid that Patreon could fall apart or, or Kickstarter Uh could fall apart or Twitter could fall Mm -hmm. apart and have a lot of legs under your table because history has shown you just in the last 10, 15, 20 years that they will fall apart, you know? Live space, not so much anymore. MySpace, uh, you know, <laughs> Friendster, yeah. uh, it's littered with all the models that we used in the past, you know, uh, yeah. Flickr yeah. and all gone. So um, anyway, 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 you're right, though. I think, though, that the even the smallest hint of a hit to our income will be the fire that that gets us back. And as we've seen from you in the past couple months, that that it's yeah. it's uh, it's it's lit a fire under your butt again and and more power to you. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. So, Brad, I wanted to do an update for folks, and this update Hmm. is very specific for those of us using Instagram, because I wanted to talk about what... Speaking of spidey senses, as Brad said earlier, I have a spidey sense of scams happening on Instagram. And uh, it's different than the ones that we all get of like, uh, hey, I I love your art. I just happened to stumble upon it. Would you like to sell it as an NFT? Contact me, you know, and you're like, all right, thanks, Spammy McSpamberton. Um, uh, But this one is specific. So I want to set the stage that I it's so rare that anyone unprompted asked me to do commissions. Oh, yeah. no one, no one just straight up emails me anymore. I get like maybe one a year, two a year. No one unprompted. Like if I say, hey, for San Diego Comic-Con, I'm doing commissions and I have mm-hmm. opened my commissions list. Then within a couple of days that fills up. So, yes, that's different. But unprompted, it's so rare for anyone to ask me to do commissions. Yet on Instagram, it happens two to three times a week. Uh, the other wow. day I had it, it happen two to three times a day. And it really, uh, uh, you know, triggered my spidey senses. 
And so this is me telling you that in a situation like that, listen to your spidey sense, because I don't know what 100 percent kind of scam this is. Yeah. But I can smell a scam a mile away and something is fishy about all these people suddenly asking on a platform that doesn't normally have a lot of like fandom engagement in a way that that Twitter used to or, or even Reddit does that they're like, oh, I got to yeah. get a commission from Dave Kellett. Uh, hey, do you do commissions? I'd love to ask you unprompted to do a commission. I don't know what the scam is, Brad, but my yeah. spidey senses are telling me it's a scam. Well, here's here's one scam. I, I don't know which scam that they're running on you, but here's one scam, as long as we're talking about it, that you definitely look out for, because this has been perpetrated quite a bit in the past. I wrote about this for webcomics.com uh, uh, a few years ago, and, and here's how it works. Listen to this, and this is backed up by uh, different attorneys general offices that were saying, yeah, we're seeing a lot of this. Uh, the client generously overpays for the price being commissioned, Right. So you're like, I'll do a commission. I usually charge a hundred dollars. They're like, ah, I'll give you a thousand. You're worth it. Right. And of course, who's going to argue with that? Right. Later on, something comes up and they kindly ask for a portion of the money to be returned, usually wired from your bank account. But apps like Venmo and Cash App are popular, too. After that, you find out that the check you originally received was fraudulent and the entire amount of the original check is just removed from your account. You've got no control over that. It was a fraudulent check. So they just take the money back. And that leaves you without the original money and without the money that you just wired to the fraudster. You don't you don't have that original check and That's you wired the them back money. That's the scam. That, <laughs> yeah, That's what this is. You wired them back money thinking, well, it's okay. I'm going to wire them back money. It's extra money anyway. I was asking a hundred. They gave me a thousand. I'll, I'll send them 500. I'm still up 400 on the deal. Nope. You're out 500 on the deal because yeah. you just gave up money and later on. And it's usually, you know, through a check. Uh, that turns out was fraudulent and then boom, you're right out. So that's, and, and so just, just to, just to give you a heads up, if you've got somebody that's paying you more than you're asking for, it probably ain't because you're such a great artist. That would be my first inclination. It's because they're setting you up for a scam. I, okay. That's, I bet that's what this is because yeah. I knew something was up. No one asked me for, it's kind of a, it's kind of a version of Brad of like, I know how pretty I am. Like yeah. no women are actively <laughs> hitting on me when I walk into a bar. And then suddenly there's like five women. Oh my God. Have I ever told you this story? Uh, by myself, <laughs> no, I separated I out from. If you had. Uh, I, I separated myself out from people I was traveling with Par through Paris with because I yeah. wanted to go see Sacre Coeur, the, the, the hilltop church. It's all white in, in Paris. And no one else wanted to go see it. So I'm like, I'll go by myself. I hop yeah. on a metro. I get off at the metro station by Sacre Coeur. And I'm walking to, kind of towards the hill. And all of a sudden, all these women in French are hitting on me. And I'm like, oh, my spidey senses immediately. And then I, yeah. <laughs> like, like the country boy that went to the city, I immediately go, oh, prostitution. That's what this is. <laughs> oh, I ain't that handsome. <laughs> this is not, no one's interested in me. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is very fishy and so i like like literally like a country farm boy i was like oh i figured out what this is, this is. so it. anyway me on instagram suddenly being asked for a bunch of commissions i was like listen yeah. i'm not that handsome nobody nobody wants a commission this badly from dave kell out of them there's got to be a right. scam and you figured it out that's what yeah. this is i bet i bet that's what this is yeah. And, and that's a scam that's been going on for a long time for people dealing with commissions that's that's one you definitely want to look out for yeah, I, I mean, listen, I, uh, I it's it's good to know your business. And uh -huh. I, I just know I know how wanted uh, my commissions are. And they're yeah. like at one percent. So if right. it starts to spike up to fit 10, 20, 30 percent of my readers are clamoring. Well, then something's wrong. Something yeah. there's a scam there. I, and maybe that's just mistrusting humanity. But I can I can sense it, you know. And especially if you're getting a couple, two, three in the same day, that's yeah. that's definitely weird. Uh, and listen, Dave, as long as we're doing updates, uh, you told us last week that you were having a lot of trouble with writer's block. We we tried to we tried to kind of jumpstart a couple things. We tried to uh, talk about a couple yes. Strategies. Yes. What's the update? How are you doing with writer's block? The good. Well, the good news, and everybody should should take some solace from this, is that I think it's passed. Um, yeah. In fact, I know it's passed because I've written two or three that I've been happy with in the last the week. So yeah. that's good. Um, and and I think that again, it goes back to the this too shall pass. And I was definitely yeah. just in a moment. And yeah. and the way to get through it is to just keep powering through it. Yeah. It, it's. Yeah. 
I probably was a little bit depressed and probably maybe some seasonal affected disorder. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But also there's just this is a time of change for me personally. And that always triggers a bunch of, uh, you know, sort of energy of shutting down. Um, but sometimes all the conditions can be perfect and you can still have writer's block. But yeah. the good news is I, I think I'm, I'm on the other side of it now. Good. I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear that. I was, I was, I was thinking about you a lot over the past week and, oh, and thank cause you. I, I think we all know how painful that, that process is. And well, uh, yeah, you genuinely feel like you had your last best idea and you're yeah. like, well, it's over. I'm going to hang up yeah. the hat. And this is it. It's all done. It's all done. I was telling Carolyn about that. And she's like, do I need to call Dave and give him the talk? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do I need to call? Because <laughs> she, she always does the same thing. She's like, you do this every three months. Yeah, it's going to be OK. You know, yeah. take yeah. take a walk. Go do something different for a little while. You know, you know, what, you know, what would have been amazing had she called me and said, like, hey, <laughs> can I hire you to do a commission? I would have been like, scam, scam. This is a scam. I don't know what the scam is, but this is a scam. I know something's up. Well, I got I got one more update that I want to bring. And this is some happy news that, that comes yeah. to Brad and I and that uh, Brad uh, got his comic uh, this past week up to the front page on Reddit. Uh, it jumped up on uh, funny and then also I got up uh, to to Reddit. And yeah. Brad, I think you told me in passing that it got two million views by getting to the front page. Is that right? It, it got uh, fifty six thousand upvotes. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, it had gotten. Uh, well over 2 million views at the end of that day. Woo. Woo, Nelly. Now, Two million. okay, because I think this is so helpful for all of us because we always talk about it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. And first of all, how lovely that you got that to in front of 2 million yeah. people. What a wonderful thing. None of us can, can look askance on that great news. But the question <laughs> has to be asked, <laughs> how many followers did you get from two million people seeing that delightful comic two million with an m two million people at the uh, uh, by by the time the dust settled i had picked up six new followers to my account on <laughs> yes, six. yes and i i got a couple of patreon backers during this uh, uh, same span of time but when I sent them my questionnaire, they said that they had found out about my Patreon through my website. Now, again, did they bounce off of Reddit to my website? I, it's, it's impossible to tell. But right. uh, the, the upshot is this. And here's the deal. So this has happened. We've had this conversation, both you and I, different times. You hit a wave and you go viral and it's mm -hmm. like and, and nothing came of it. And I got to tell you, I was much more Zen about it, even as it was happening, even as it was happening, I was much more Zen because it's like, I know nothing's going to actually come of this and, and it's okay. It's okay. In other words, I, I think we, as a group, uh, uh, and I mean, cartoonists as a group, comics artists, we've got to stop looking for that one day fix, that one day revelation to our careers where you go viral one day and then you're famous the next day and, and then and then all your problems are over, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think we, we've got to take when that stuff is happening, we, of course, you do everything. I, I, I put a little comment in there uh, linking both to my site and and uh, the the uh, Comic Lab podcast, uh, I, I did all of the things just to make sure that I was making use of the moment. But when it was all over, it was over, and 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 I went back to work because really, what we're doing here is this is what we do. We we put some we put ourselves uh, out on the web. We we allow it to be shared freely in the idea of slowly building up an audience and mm -hmm. this is going to, and, and now it, it, it's it, it, next week, I'm going to post something. It probably isn't going to go anywhere near that because it's, it's like hitting the lottery. You hit that match. And, and I really do think Dave, it's like, uh, you hit a magic combination of people who just are either in a, in the right mood. They like your stuff. It's just something hit them just right in that first hour. And then, at, yeah, and, and then it has when you to be juiced off. in that first couple hours. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. And then what happens after that, once it gets a whole, and I could tell within the first 15 minutes that I was going to have a good day because I'd gotten a lot of up, up votes. It was just bang it, bang it, bang it, bang it. And it's like, uh, after that it succeeds because it's successful, right? Because right. It, it, it's, it's, right. it's getting, it's, it's juicing the algorithm. So it, it gets sent out to more people, which means that it's going to do better automatically, which means it's going to be successful. And it's just a, a, a feedback loop at that point. 
Uh, but I, I don't spend if if and when this happens to you, don't get upset that you didn't get a whole bunch of new followers or that your life uh, was made uh, in that instance. Here's the deal. This is what we do. We we build slow. We this is all a slow build. Even those viral days are part of your slow build. Yes. And that's yes. OK. That's OK. The, the, the point is to come back and do it again tomorrow or do something similar tomorrow and, and to keep in it uh, because. Uh, listen, we, we all go for that viral moment and then we get disappointed when it isn't all it's cracked up to be. Uh, uh, take it as a matter of course. This is this is all part of a much, much bigger race. And listen, let's play this into that question that we got a week or two ago that said, hey, should I pay for a marketer to yeah. help me with my comic? Yeah. Because let's say, for example, that Brad had paid a marketer to get this in front of two million people. Yes. The result would be the same as what Brad is seeing right now. Six right. new followers and and a couple hundred thousand people that have now been exposed to Brad who will remember right. him enough such that when they see him again, they are a tiny bit more inclined oh, yeah. to slow down and read. You know, that's also a benefit because remember, we're trying to get it in front of 100,000 people so that 10,000 people become passing fans so that we get to that 1,000 true fans that will spend money on Brad's Patreon or Brad's Kickstarter and Brad's books. And so yeah. on uh, by this virality that Brad had this week, He's kind of shortcutted a little bit of stage yep. one, which is get it in front of 100,000 people. Right. And and that actually was some of the comments that I got was, oh, I recognize that art style. That's Brad yeah. Geiger. It's so good yeah. to see you on the front page. Oh, look at that. It's Brad. Ge there was a lot of that where, where they recognized that style and mm -hmm. they came over to make a, a, a polite, pleasant comment about uh oh yeah i know this guy this is kind of cool uh that was that was those were the good comments Dave. <laughs> <laughs> i know Reddit can be oh so my God. gosh darn mean and you're like yeah uh i love it when i get a, a, a something to the front page of comics or funny or, or the front page of reddit yeah. and it's being upvoted 20 30 40 000 people right like clearly people are enjoying it and yeah. you get these comments like who thinks this is funny how could anyone think this is funny yeah. how is this in any way a good comic and you want to be like Motherfucker, 40,000 people voted yeah. this up. That's who thinks N it's funny. 90% upvote rate on 56,000 upvotes. 90% upvote rate. But there's rate. still, go, there's just go. this, there's this, there's this percentage of angry young dudes and you can tell oh, yeah. that they're angry young dudes. They're just, yeah. you can feel their aloneness and their sadness. It's like, <laughs> it's like that phrase of the hurt people hurt people. You can yeah. feel it in their comments that they're just hurt and they're alone and they're like just lashing out. Feel it nothing. I'm a vindictive, spiteful bastard. When somebody <laughs> when somebody puts that kind of comment on my good day, I go, you go to Reddit, you can see all the other stuff they're commenting about. And I would go, and there was this one guy that was, you know, vitriolic. And I and I and I went through his comments, and within the five or six comments, he's talking about his ex-wife leaving him and he doesn't get to see his kids and all this other stuff. And I'm like, oh, it, it, I was this close to just going into doing one of those Midwest nice responses saying, oh man, I'm really sorry you're hurt. And it sounds like that's very painful. I'm, I'm wishing you all the best, you know, that, that yeah. real good Midwest nice that gets you right between the ribs, you know, but I, but I, I, I do that all the time. It's like, this guy's being an asshole. Let's see how his life has fallen apart. And it's, it happens every time. Yeah, and then I just sit there and go and Ah, good. I hope you're hurting. I, I hope you get hit by a bus while you're out there. Yeah, you can see why <laughs> you check it out and you can. It, what's interesting, though, in Reddit, having a history versus Twitter and other things um, yeah. where it's a little harder to search, you can see very quickly that like, oh, the reason why this person is a troll is they're living a very unhappy life yeah. right now. You know, it's, yeah. not, it's not an accident how this happens. Anyway, I want to say, though, let's swing back around because this is a wonderful teaching moment that yeah. you had two or three people jump in on Patreon during the same time that this was going viral. Yeah. And I will say this, I'm not entirely sure that that's not related, but right. I, I think it's best to look at it this way, is that Brad is putting out his comic on his website, on Twitter, on Reddit, on all sorts of other places that he can, right? Because none of us are ever 100% sure, especially right. in a repeatable way, what was the path that got someone to say, you know yeah. what? Yes, I would like to to back Brad Geiger's work on Patreon, right? Yeah. And so I'm what I'm saying is I don't think that they weren't already a huge fan of of Brad Geiger, but it might be the case that yeah. seeing you up on the front page of Reddit being like, you know what? Yeah, I do want to back that guy yeah. on Patreon. Um, and, so, and that's yeah. 
And we don't know if it's Reddit. We don't know. It could have been Twitter. Could have been Facebook. Could have been yep. Instagram. The only thing we know for sure is it wasn't Mastodon. <laughs> oh my god you are gonna pour lemon juice on mastodon's wounds for I really years am. to come i really am uh boy, the thing is you called it you called it but it's not gonna be mastodon everybody anyway no. um but i i say this because i was thinking about the exact clickable moment that got me to back Carl Kershaw's new book on Kickstarter. Yeah. Because yeah. I always like to think about the mental game that got me to say, and the truth is, I read Carl's work on his website. I follow mm -hmm. him on Twitter. I see him on Instagram. I see him elsewhere in, in my life online. Yeah. I don't know. But maybe, maybe it required seeing it in all those places before I backed yep. his Kickstarter. So yep. maybe for Brad's two or three new Patreon folks, maybe it required them seeing Brad on Twitter, seeing yep. him on Instagram, and now seeing him on the front page of Reddit, and that got them to make the decision. What I'm saying is you never really know the final path that gets someone to become one of your thousand true fans, yep. and therefore good to keep syndicating on all these different models as you go forward. And Absolutely true. And such a good point. So listen, Dave, we've got a little bit of time before the end of the show, and we've got, we've got to answer a question at some point from one of our <laughs> Patreon backers. I'm starting to feel guilty. So let's let's get this question uh, that I think we can uh, that we can talk about. This comes in from our friend Jay Lark, who says, I've noticed a growing interest in knowing one's personality type, including Myers-Briggs, but others as well. Do you have any thoughts on leveraging one's personality traits to be a better comic creator in terms of finishing our work on timely manner, collaborating with others, telling compelling stories? Thanks. I always love hearing from you guys. So, Dave, J. Lark is saying, should we be using things like a Myers-Briggs personality test to help get a handle on our creative process? Uh, so I have some weighted thoughts on this in that I, I personally, when I think of something like a Myers-Briggs, it feels a little bit like a BuzzFeed quiz, like <laughs> which Brad, yes. which of the, which of the sex in the city girls are you? Cause I'm a Samantha. Are you, yeah. are you a Miranda Brad? I think you're a Miranda, aren't you? And, I mean, cause in a little bit, it's, it's like fun, silly and pseudoscience. Like to me, Myers-Briggs yeah. feels like pseudoscience, you know? Um, but it's like silly, but it's also, these are the small ways that we all try to make sense of ourselves in a very complicated world where there's no man user manual for being a human being. And so we try to take the bits and pieces that are working for us to sort of help us figure out who we are and what motivates us and how we do it. So I'm, in my kinder aspects of my personality, I'm like, all right, if Myers, yeah. Squib if Myers Briggs helps you to, to figure out who you are, then I guess it serves a purpose. But then the cynical side of me is like, nah, it just feels like, it feels like a, a hogwash in terms of, uh, a, oh, Brad, I'm an Aquarius, but when Saturn is rising, you know me, I love to be creative. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And and listen, the good news is if it feels like pseudoscience to, uh, to you, then you've got an awful lot in common with most psychologists <laughs> who take a look at the uh, or uh, take a look at the Myers-Briggs uh, personality chats. There's not a lot of people taking this seriously. I'm going to quote now from a Vox.com uh, article, quote, there's just no evidence behind it, unquote, says Adam Grant, an organizational psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania who's written about the shortcomings of Myers-Briggs previously, quote, the characteristics measured by the test have almost no predictive power and how happy you'll be in a situation, how you'll perform at a job or how happy you'll be in your marriage, unquote. It's, it's, listen, uh, like, like Dave said, you have about as much luck using your horoscope to decide how you should uh, approach your creativity, how you should do time management, all this stuff. It's bupkis. The only thing that's useful is that it's getting you to pay attention to it. And, and yeah. half the yeah. time, that's the hardest thing is just like, remember the stub the table uh, conversation we had a couple of shows ago where I said, hey, do you want to do better at this? It's the same as saying, I want to not stub my table on that coffee table. You just pay don't, attention don't. to the coffee table when you're walking yeah. through the living room. All this 
this does is it's making you pay attention. And, and, and if this is what it takes to get you to pay attention, then fine. But honestly, it goes right back to that motivation. You should be paying attention on your own. Nobody should be trying to handle this for you. You need to pay attention on your own. Uh, I think the whole thing is bupkis. I, I, I wouldn't touch this with a 10 foot pole using Myers Briggs uh, to help me be creative and all that stuff. I think, yeah, I think you, what you need to do is pay attention, but if this is what it takes for you, then, then fine, go ahead and do it. Yeah. I'm in some respects, it's, you know, many paths to the same mountain that if this is, if this is the path that helps you, right. um, on your journey to figuring out who you are, then great. Because maybe, yeah. maybe you'll spend a year or two. If, if you're like me or anybody else, you'll, you'll spend uh, six months to a year, like exploring uh, how, how this could work for you and how this could, like, for example, I did a, a meditation class or two in LA in my twenties when I first got here. Well, like one of yeah. our improv friends, were like, Oh, you guys got to try meditation. It's really helpful for creativity. <laughs> and I tried it. And there are, there are actually one or two aspects of things that I learned from that class. But for the most part, I found it not helpful for me on my journey. But again, it's many paths. So you may find like I did with meditation that, most of Myers-Briggs doesn't help you, but maybe there's one or two tiny aspects of that self-exploration of who am I, how do I operate, how do I work in this world can be helpful towards figuring out the things you need to do to treat yourself better so that you are ready to create when it's time to sit down so that your writing yeah. does have uh, happier voices answering it in your own internal monologue, you know, that kind of thing. So, um well, I guess what I'm saying is, even though I it, it's not for me and I don't walk that path, maybe maybe it is for you and maybe it's not 99 percent for you. But that one percent is super key and helpful, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. For you, Brad, you and I have both had a whole novels that we've thrown out whole cloth. But there was one quote in there that has stayed with us. You know, yeah. like I remember the single line from Brothers Karamazov. Don't like the book pretty terribly, but there's one or two lines that just stay with me my whole life. You know, yes. and yes. that's all that that I needed to get from that was that it has instructed my life. Oh. It has helped. It helped shape me. You know, and and yes. but 99 percent of the I don't need to hear about the coal in the fire for the ninth time, you know, <laughs> Oh my God. Yes. I, and specifically, I remember you telling me about that book by Susan McTaggart. And you said that there was that one quote. Oh, 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 to hell with with you. You. <laughs> oh Brad. That stuck with you for so long. It was about a, uh, about a happy marriage. And you said, you said, ah, oh, that quote, I'll never forget it. If I live to be a thousand years old, I'll never forget that quote. Well, you know, uh, yeah, I, I do. Remember. Hello, friends. Susan McTagger here, author of the book, Stay Ready So You Don't Have to Get Ready. And, <laughs> and friends, I just want to say, uh, you know, I, a quote for everyone out there. To laugh is to love and to love is to laugh, which is why it's such a shame that you have that bonkers crazy laugh. <laughs> Anyway, Susan McTaggart, look for my new book, Stay Ready So You Don't Have to Get Ready, coming out from Penguin House Publishers in the fall. Oh, my God. That was great. I thought I finally had you on the ropes, but you uh, uh, you uh, out improv me. Uh, uh, well, oh, but, <laughs> but in all seriousness, listen, this this is part of your creative process. And and like Dave says, if that if if, if, if this is one of your inroads and you're probably going to find a lot of these things over the course yeah. of time, if this yeah. is your inroad to uh, getting a better handle on your uh, creativity, then go for it. Don't don't let me uh, rain on your parade. But but I, unfortunately, uh, where you're on your inroad, Dave and I. We're on the out road. We're at the end of another episode of Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my friend, Brad Geiger, who is absolutely a Miranda. I can tell you in all the personality tests, it all points to him being a Miranda. And I say that as a Samantha. I know a Miranda when I see it. I know a Miranda when I see it. He is the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evilcomic.com. And my good friend, Dave Kellett, uh, who was, by the way, absolutely correct. Uh, he was right about the Miranda. Uh, I, I guess I feel as if I've gotten my Miranda rights. My friend, Dave <laughs> Kellett. <laughs> oh, for God's sake. You <laughs> slipped that in so <laughs> quiet. Oh. The co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. 
And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by our pal Matt Woodard, who is an absolute Capricorn. I mean, yes. I got to tell you, Brad, if, he, if uh, I've ever seen a Capricorn, it's Matt Woodard. Matt, and he Matt is a Matt always wood- does good work, always does good work. But ever since Metro, ever since Mercury has been in retrograde, it's been like chef's kiss. It's been, it's been, I love, by the way, that all of that is based on a star chart that's not even accurate anymore. It's a 2,000 year old star chart. Anyway, so uh, this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. And if you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. You may hear your review featured on a future episode. Meanwhile, if you're listening to us on Spotify, thank you so much for keeping us right there at the top. If, if you haven't given us a five star rating and review yet, please. Please take some time to do that. We're getting a lot of traction out there on Spotify, and we appreciate your helping us along the way. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support on Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. Okay, so Brad, I have to ask you, you put this comic up on Funny. It yeah. rockets up Funny. It moves up to the front page of Funny. And then the yeah. algorithm kicks in for overall Reddit, and it takes it from the front page of Funny, puts it on the front page of Reddit itself. It continues to rocket up. Okay, that comic, undeniably good. I loved it from the first time you texted it to me, right? I, you yeah. and I both agree. And it's also that comic, as all of your comics are right now, represent 20, 25 years of excellent comic making. It's like all the work for the past comics went into the informing of this comic, right? Yes, yes. So now here's my question for you. That exact same comic, when you posted it on Twitter Uh, and uh, on our comics, how did it do, Brad? How did it do? Twitter, it got three, I went and looked up my stats. It had 300 impressions. Uh, Instagram, (laughs) Instagram, it didn't have much more. I I mean, literally I didn't get even, even a fraction of a fraction. It it got 300, 400, uh, impressions, certainly nowhere near as many upvotes. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the same thing, the same exact thing that was setting the world on fire on Reddit. Nobody gave two shits about on Twitter. Yeah. Or even on our comics, like it did okay on our comics, but, but what I'm getting at here is 25 years you've put oh. in the work you have you have become the cartoonist to produce that comic which you know can get in front of two million people and make fifty thousand people laugh out loud right you know you can do that you have the chops but yeah. there's something weird sort of we just have to acknowledge in social media that i keep going back to the metaphor the visual metaphor of a plinko thing where you drop yeah. the thing at the top of plinko and sometimes you end up on the far side for statistical reasons you can't figure out and sometimes bam you're right in that one slot that gets you a thousand dollars oh and yeah it's weird that that i i, I just want to acknowledge for all of us that you can be producing amazing work like brad did that in three channels it did absolutely ghost town and the other yeah. one it got to two million people yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The only thing it was good for, the only thing, and, and again, yeah, it, it, it was fine. It was great. The only thing that I really took home out of that whole uh, being viral on Reddit was I rubbed my kids' noses in it all weekend long. <laughs> I would sit there and I'd, I'd have my phone out. Ah, uh, yep, uh, 30,000. They're up to 30,000 uh, upvotes, 90% upvote. And the kids are like, come on, get over it. And I'm like, okay, I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm over 35,000, as a matter of fact. <laughs> All weekend long, all week, because they're always, ah, Dad, you're not as funny as you think I am. Well, I guess what? Two million people think I'm pretty freaking funny. 